Father, as we find our way in your word, we pray that you'd prepare our hearts to receive it. Uh, we know, Lord, that when we come together, it's not just some uh, academic or intellectual exercise. We need to open up ourselves to you truly, Lord, on every level so that you could speak to us. So we lay aside our distractions and our defenses, and we ask that you would speak to us now, Lord, in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 37, let me read to you the first three verses. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. When you spend some time studying the book of Ezekiel, you find that the early chapters up until chapter 33, where Joel Rosenborg spoke to us about this afternoon, up until chapter 33, it is thick with judgment and sometimes scathing judgment. Sure, there are several chapters about judgment on the nation surrounding, but the core of the first 33 chapters of the book of Ezekiel is judgment against the kingdom of Judah. And man, Ezekiel, inspired by the Lord, he lays into him and he explains in vivid, sometimes almost offensive detail, how ripe they are and deserving they are of the judgment of God. Then late in chapter 33, beyond the portion that Joel spoke to us about this afternoon, Ezekiel receives a message from a messenger who came from Jerusalem, and this is the message. The message was that what Ezekiel had prophesied for years had finally come to pass. Jerusalem was completely conquered and destroyed by the Babylonians. The temple was burned. The city was in ruin, virtually depopulated, and it was over. Everything that Ezekiel said was going to come had come to pass. He was utterly vindicated, but you can know he wasn't happy about it at all. His own city, his own people, under the severe judgment of God. Now, here's what's remarkable about this. After that, in the book of Ezekiel, things turned bright. You see, after God had warned about his coming judgment, after God did everything he possibly could to turn his people from the course of judgment or to prepare them for what was going to come, after the judgment came, God said, now we can look to brighter days. Now I can announce to you about the work that will come. And in the chapters after chapter 33, that would be chapter 34 to the end of the book, Sure, there's sprinklings of God's discipline throughout, but the overwhelming tone is one of grace and renewal and refreshment. And chapter 37 is right along in that line. God led Ezekiel in a vision. At least that's what we gather when it says, the hand of the Lord came upon me. And then it says, he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord. It doesn't exactly say that this was a vision, but it almost seems certainly that that's what Ezekiel experienced at that place and at that time. And God gave him a vision of this valley full of dry bones. He looked out upon it, and that's all he could see everywhere he looked. He saw a valley filled with these dry bones. Now, Let's cut to the chase with it right now. I could kind of play coy with this, but why do that? Verse 11 specifically tells us in this chapter that this is Israel. This is the entire house of Israel. By the way, it's interesting, and I'll speak about it when we get to verse 11. He's not just speaking about just the kingdom of Judah or just the northern kingdom of Israel. He's talking about the entire house of Israel. This is what is represented by this valley of dry bones. It's important for us to realize that. That more than anything, Ezekiel chapter 37 is about God's promise to renew and refresh Israel and, in the larger context, to bring them back into the land. I have to tell you something, brothers. After spending time in Ezekiel over the past few months, I have been struck in such a remarkable way about the clarity and the strength and even the eloquence of God's promises to give the land to Israel. 
I, I mean, it's absolutely staggering. And promises that are so big and so beautiful and so strong that nobody can believe that those promises were fulfilled by the return from the Babylonian captivity. They just weren't. And so it has to point to a glorious work that God would yet do that we see the beginnings of it in our own day, at least since 1948. So what we're talking about here is Israel, but I need to remind you of a larger context here. Especially when you go into the previous chapter, Ezekiel chapter 36, you find that we are in now new covenant territory. What does that mean? Well, new covenant territory tells us that the new covenant was something that God in the Old Testament was made to the Jewish people. In the Old Testament, there was very little indication, I won't say none, but there was very little indication in the Old Testament that Gentiles would be brought into the New Covenant as Gentiles. That was a mystery not to be revealed until apostolic times. So when we see these new covenant passages, we can see that, yes, God, you're talking about the restoration of Israel, but you're talking about it as part of the new covenant. And we know, we know that even we have some share spiritually in the new covenant. So I tell you that to tell you this. We're going to take a look at this text in front of us. Yes, talking about how it refers to what God would do about the Jewish people and reassemble, gather them as a nation, and plant them in the land. We're going to see that, but we're also going to see what this passage says to us as believers. So I don't know if you've ever experienced it. I don't know if you've ever experienced it in your personal life, in your family life, in your church life, maybe in the broader Christian world where your spiritual experience feels just like a valley full of dry bones. Matter of fact, isn't that the first thing that God told Ezekiel to do? Ezekiel saw this large expanse, this valley. He saw what you might call the true death valley because everywhere it was strewn with bones, bones baked in the sun. And what did he do? Verse two says that God commanded him to walk all around, and notice that there were very many in the open valley. God told Ezekiel, walk out among the bones and see what's out there. Get up close and spiritual about the spirit, up close and personal, I should say, about the spiritual condition of your people. Look at it. Don't kid yourself. Brothers, and I'll speak to you as pastors and as men in ministry, pastors and men serving the Lord, doesn't it kind of get you a little bit sick to your stomach when you think that you may be overestimating the spiritual health of your congregation? That, that, there, there may be things in their life that look pretty good on the outside, but you scratch underneath, and it could just be a pile of dead bones. God told Ezekiel, go out and see the bones. Walk all around them. And this is what he noticed. He noticed that the lives represented by those bones, they weren't only dead, but they were also disgraced. You understand this, don't you? That in the thinking of ancient Israel and the ancient Near East, in that part of the world, there was a fate worse than death. And the fate worse than death was to die and have your corpse exposed and unburied to be left for whatever scavengers or predators or, or just to be eaten by insects and worn away. That was truly a fate worse than death. And when he sees a valley full of unburied corpses, these are people not only dead, but utterly disgraced. These are people that have no life and in a sense, no dignity. We wonder if maybe this didn't connect with the memory that Ezekiel had. I imagine him on his journey from Jerusalem to the kingdom of Babylon, and along the way, him passing battlefields where there's strewn bones everywhere from soldiers that were too numerous to bury after a battle. And he sees it. And he sees this death and disgrace everywhere. And they've been out there a long time. Look at verse 2. It says that they were very dry. You see, apart from their presence in a living body, bones are dead. 
I suppose that bones inside of us, they live all the time. There's marrow, there's functioning cells and such. But take them out of a living body, bones die. And these bones had been long dead. You see, bones are what remains when life has passed. If something never had life, it wouldn't leave bones. But bones are a dual reminder. Uh, it reminds you right then in the present day that there's no life, but it also tells you that there was life in the past. Because if there was never life to begin with, it would never leave behind bones. Then the question comes. God speaks to the prophet. Did you see it there in verse 3? What was the question? Son of man. That was the address that God usually used in addressing Ezekiel. Son of man. Can these bones live? I wonder how long it took Ezekiel to respond to that question. I wonder if he thought, what's the right answer? But I tell you, he gave the right answer. Did you see what his answer was at the end of verse 3? What did he say? Oh, Lord God, you know. I think that was a brilliant answer. You see, without presumption, Ezekiel anticipated God's work. One, somebody might hope that a recently dead corpse might somehow resuscitate. You know, you have the widow's son in the days of Elisha. He rose. You have um, the girl that Jesus uh, ministered to, the, the, the synagogue ruler's daughter. She rose. You have the boy, the widow's son that was risen on the way to... The, you have Lazarus. You have these people recently dead. There's a corpse. There's something that looks like it become reanimated. You look at a pile of dead bones? What hope is there for that? Yet he had the only hope that could be found. He said, oh, Lord God, you know. I'm not going to presume, Lord. I'm not going to tell you what is your business to do. But I'll tell you this, God, it's not impossible with you. I know you could do it. There's no hope on an earthly basis, but you are able to do this. I've got no hope in the bones whatsoever, but I am full of hope in God. But at the same time, isn't it wonderful that Ezekiel didn't presume to know what God would do? Sometimes we're kind of bad at telling God what his business should be, isn't it? Sometimes I think we spend a lot of times, fruitless time, I don't know if God's annoyed by it, I think he probably just smiles in heaven. Oh, my son, you think you know my plan, don't you? You're just telling me my business all over again. And you can't see the things I see. You don't know I'm going to work in a different direction. You can't anticipate it all. No, Ezekiel wouldn't tell God what his business was, but he was confident that God did know. You know, God, you would not have brought me to these bones unless you had a plan for him. Can anybody possibly conceive that God would bring Ezekiel in this vision to the Valley of Dry Bones, show him the bones, ask him the question, and then God said, yep, that's it, they're dead, now go home. <laughs> I mean, what, what's the point? God, you've quickened my heart to it. You've shown me this vision. You've shown me the spiritual condition of Israel for a reason. Man, when you are awakened to the dry spiritual condition in your own life, it's for a reason. God wants to do something about it. When you are awakened to the dry spiritual condition in your family, in your congregation, it's because God wants to do something about it. He's not just calling you, hey, can, can these dry bones live? No, nah, I don't know. Okay, good, go home. It's not that at all. So now, look at what God tells him to do in verse 4. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. All right, let me get out of preacher mode just for a moment. I'll speak as objective. Let's just say I'm a guy who doesn't know anything about the Bible. Let's just, I'm brand new to the Bible. I just read this, and I read verse 4, and I say, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> you're going to preach to a bunch of skeletons. That's what you're going to do. You're going to preach 
to, to things that have no faculty to hear, to things that are dead. What's the point? Now, in the previous verse, Ezekiel deliberately left the matter with God. He said, God, I'm leaving it to you. Lord God, you know. And what did God do in turn? God gave the prophet something to do. This is this God says, I know, God says, Ezekiel, you preach. You prophesy to those bones. You speak to them. And by every outward observation, this was a vain, a foolish act. But you know what it meant? It meant that for Ezekiel to do this, he had to have what you might even call a foolish confidence in God's word. Brothers, that's what I'm calling you to here right now tonight. I want you to have a confidence in God's word that is so great that an onlooking world would look at it and say, are you a fool? You really believe this is the word of God? You really believe this can be trusted? You believe this can be trusted so much that you believe that you can teach from this book and really make the point of your message, the point of this book, and make this your focus, this your theme. Of course, you'll throw in some illustrations. You'll throw in the anecdotes. But those things, that's not the core of your message. The core of your message is this book. Other things may come along and illustrate or supplement or that. This is your message. And you think that this thousands of year old book is going to change lives and do things? Yes. And you say, yes, indeed, I do believe that. I believe it with all my heart. I've seen God do it time and time again. And I'm not going to make a speech. I'm not going to uh, recite the Gettysburg Address to the dead bones. Shakespeare wrote some beautiful stuff. That's not going to help him. But the word of the living God, that can make the difference. This is it. Amen. Now, many years later, the Apostle Paul acknowledged that the message of the cross, God's rescue for lost humanity in the person and work of Jesus Christ. What did Paul say about it? He said that it was foolishness to those who are perishing. It was just about as crazy as preaching to a bunch of dry dead bones. And Paul says, I'll do it. We do it. And brothers, if we want to see God move, we must continue to preach God's word. Amen. I know that in our current atmosphere, it makes us feel like dinosaurs. It really does. I, I don't know if you know what's out there in the culture. I don't know if you know what's out there in the Christian world. And maybe it's better if you don't. <laughs> But sometimes when you look what's out there, you go, really? I, I'm really going to teach them the Bible? I'm really going to believe that this has the power to transform lives, to bring life to that which was dead? And yet we say, yes, it does. Yes, it has that power. So what does he do? This is what he's going to say. Verse 4. I love this. Can you just imagine Ezekiel preaching to a valley full of bones? Now, you say, of course, I can imagine that. You say, that's what I do every Sunday. <laughs> Some of you guys right now, in your mind's eye, you're picturing you standing before a, a congregation full of skeletons. <laughs> well, go right ahead and imagine them that way. That's fine. Preach to those dry bones. Preach it nevertheless. What, did you want an easy calling? <laughs> that's not this. It's not what you're doing now. Verse 4, I love this. Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. That's a message you can only preach full of faith in God. Hear the word of the Lord. They don't have ears. <laughs> but God's word is powerful. He was confident that if he spoke the word of the Lord, then God's word had a supernatural power. He spoke with great faith in God's word. And sometimes I think God just needs to uh, excite our faith in his word. We feel sometimes that what we do is a bit of a drudgery. Week in, week out, every Sunday, every Wednesday, it comes pretty quick, doesn't it? And you get in that rhythm and then all the other things you got to do during a week. And it's easy. It might even be a snare of the devil to get it locked into a routine, a drudgery. And think, is this really doing anything good? I don't see. Listen, you're preaching to dry bones sometime. You just preach away. 
And you do it with full confidence in the power of God's word. Because this was his promise. This is what he was to preach, full of faith to those skeletons. Verse 5. Surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. God promised to fill the dry bones with breath. He promised to bring flesh upon them in verse 6 and to cover them with skin. God would take those once alive people, now dead, and make those bones live. And I'll just emphasize it again. This is a work of revival. It's restoring life to that which once had it. If it never had life, it would never have bones. And this was God's declaration. God said it would happen. And as the word of the Lord was proclaimed over them, they received God's promise of life. And that life would be marked, it says there, by breath living once again in them. Now, we're going to see the breath come in later on, starting at verse 9. But I just need to tell you something about that breath, and then most of you know this already. I, I, I could probably pick out randomly any four of you and invite you up and just explain this point right here, and you could do it from the top of your head. You could explain that in the Hebrew language, the word for breath, the word for wind, and the word for spirit are all the same word. And their meaning or interpretation is based on context. So when he says breath living in them once again, it has the connotation of wind. It also has the connotation of spirit. Because it's the same word in the ancient Hebrew, and by the way, in the ancient Greek language as well. Uh, let me just say one thing as well before we move on to verse 7. Sometimes you'll see people take this passage and apply it to the resurrection of the dead in the very last days. This is not what this passage is speaking about. This passage is speaking about the national revival of Israel, particularly in the last days as a function of the new covenant, and by spiritual analogy, how God brings life to his people today, those who need reviving. Verse 7. <laughs> He's actually going to do it. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. So can you picture Ezekiel in mind? He adjusts his prophet's mantle or whatever it is he's wearing, the belt. Okay, mm, me, me, me. And then he starts preaching to an utterly dead audience. You're not the only one who's ever had to do that. You think your first service is dead. Look at Ezekiel. <laughs> he preached to that audience. And what happened? Verse 7 says, the bones came together bone to bone. You see, as Ezekiel prophesied, first there was a noise among the bones, a rattling. And as he continued, the bones began to assemble themselves together in skeletons. Now look, let's be honest. The text does not specifically say that they assembled themselves into weird shapes. We assume that the assembly was proper. That they didn't look like freakish skeletons. God wouldn't do it that way. They assembled them. It's an interesting thought, though. God brought them together and assembled them in order, but notice how it began. It began with a rattling. I just love to picture this vision that Ezekiel must have had. There he stands. He's preaching in front of these dry bones. He's declaring the word of the Lord to them, and then he pauses for a moment. What does he hear among his dead as dry bones audience? He hears... Just a little rattling. Well, what's that? They can't be snoring. They're dead. What is it? What is it? And that smallest rattle must have been to him the most immense 
encouragement. A rattling may not seem like much, but it was the sign of much greater things to come. It was a small beginning, just like the cloud the size of a man's hand that Elijah saw in 1 Kings chapter 18. It was a small thing that was the size of something much greater. And I want you to notice this, that Ezekiel noticed every small aspect of what God was doing. Man, sometimes you just got to look for the small things that God does. I don't see much, Lord. I wish that those bones would just come together all in an instant. But I hear a rattling. It's like the sound of the wind in the mulberry trees. It's some small sign that you are on the move. And I'll take encouragement in that. And as he did, look what happens in verse 8. The sinews and flesh came upon them. After the bones were assembled, the muscles and the tissue came upon the bones. And the bones were full of activity, yet they still did not have the breath of life in them. Notice there was a process at work here. It's really remarkable, isn't it? First, you have the stirring of the bones. Then you have the assembly of the bones. Then you have the sinews coming upon the bones. I gather that's the ligaments that would join the bones together. Then you have the flesh coming upon the bone. I imagine that to be the muscles and the tissue coming upon the bones. Then you have the skin coming upon the bones. And then finally, you have what seems to be a resuscitated man down there in the valley. All he's waiting for is what? The breath of God to fill him. Now, I'll talk about that breath of God in just a few moments when we get to verses 9 and 10. But notice this. When God did this work, he did it in a process. You know, man, sometimes that's how God works. Now, God is sovereign. If he wanted to, in a moment, he could create the fully functioning being right there. But oftentimes, God says, First, I'm going to rattle the bones. Then I'm going to assemble again. Then I'll bring the ligaments. Then I'll bring the tissues. And as you've been watching this, I wonder if you've thought about the own congregation where you serve. You're a pastor. You're a man active in ministry there at your church. And you're thinking about your own congregation. You're thinking about your own youth group that you serve. And you're thinking, well, they're not dead. But then if I were to ask you this, are they a mighty army for the kingdom of God? And say, well, no, they're not there yet either. Now that's where we're going to end up. We're going to end up not, not with just a bunch of fully functioning people lying down on couches watching television. We're going to end up with a mighty army for God's kingdom. So you say, you know what, look, I'm, They're not dead bones. There's spiritual life there. Neither are they the mighty arm. They're somewhere in between. And I want you to notice, God works these things oftentimes in process. I don't want to get overly spiritual with every detail, but just by analogy, you could say, okay, Lord, I see that the ligaments are there. Would you now bring the muscles? The muscles are there. Would you bring the skin over it, Lord? Lord, now bring the next step. Wherever step you're at, Can you perceive it and ask God, do what's next to develop it? I don't want to rest, Lord, until the people that you have given me to minister unto, until they are a mighty army energized by your spirit. That's what I want to see, Lord. And I'm not going to rest until I see it. Sometimes I think, and maybe this is my confession to you. Sometimes I think that I've satisfied myself with seeing some skeletons with a few ligaments. Well, they're not dead anymore. There's not dry bones strewn all about the valley. That looks terrible. At least skeletons. Well, that's something to look at there, isn't it? Say, no, 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 no. Don't stop short. Don't stop short in the longing into your heart until you see that mighty army raised up. Well, that's what we come to here in verses 9 and 10. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet as an exceedingly great army. Isn't that awesome? All right, now, the first thing. The work of the Spirit was absolutely essential in this. You could have reanimated 
corpses that did not have the breath of life in them yet until the spirit was breathed in them into fullness. Now, I don't know what you're going to say. You say, well, wait a minute, David. Wasn't the assembly of the bones a work of the spirit? Yes, it was. Wasn't the coming of sinews and flesh? Was that a, yes, that was a work of the spirit. Well, wasn't it a work of the spirit to see the skin come? Yes, that was all a work of the spirit. But you and I know there's just a different dimension of the spirit's work. There's a different dimension when these are filled with the Spirit in a remarkable and, and, and a manner filled with great measure. And he finally says, okay, this is what I want you to do, Ezekiel. Pause now in the assembly procedure. All this has happened. Now you have these corpses that have been reanimated. But this is how the Spirit's going to come upon them. Now let me say before I say anything about this and look at what Ezekiel says about the Spirit coming upon them. You need to track with me on this. I don't think there are formulas for the work of the Holy Spirit. I don't think I can say, okay, you do A, B, and C, and D will come as the work of the Spirit. We see a pattern right here in the text. I'm going to talk about that pattern, but I want, does everybody understand? I'm not giving some magical formula or something like that. We see a pattern we ask the Spirit to use in our life. Maybe, it'll, maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit will speak to some of you and say, that's what I need. That's what I need for my individual life. That's what I need for my congregation. I can't say exactly, but listen, look at what happened here, and it's fascinating. What God told Ezekiel to do was to speak to the Spirit of God himself. Look at this, verse 9. Prophesy to the breath. Breath, ruach, spirit, wind, it could just as well be translated, prophesy to the spirit, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, breath, slash, wind, splash, spirit. And what, what do you say to the spirit? What do you say to the breath? Look at it. It's right there. Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. God told Ezekiel to pray a bold prayer imploring the Holy Spirit to come and fill those reanimated corpses. Now I'll tell you the thing that really strikes me about this, the thing that just sort of makes me, I don't know, stagger just a little bit. One, you noticed it too, is you notice the boldness that God told Ezekiel to have. Brothers, I wonder if we forget to be as bold in prayer as God asks us to be. What did he tell us there in Hebrews chapter 4? Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Boldly. And God is honored by our boldness. And I know there's a line between boldness and presumption. Sometimes we don't know where it is. Ask God to cleanse out of your heart every, every ounce of presumption. But ask him to fill you with more and more boldness. To come before God and say, God, to the best of my ability, this is what I perceive is needed here. Would you please do this? God, I call upon you to do it. Lord, you promised to do it. You're the one who told me to do this. So Lord, do this. And to pray boldly. Our Father is honored by our bold requests. You think of a little child coming up to their father. Say, Dad, I, I'd like you to, to give me something. Well, what do you want? And the child dreams of the biggest thing it could ask for. Dad, I want five dollars. <laughs> you know, and the child's trembling just a little bit. You know, really, am I so bold to ask for that much from my father? The father smiles. To the father, that's nothing. I mean, he spent that much on, you know, a cup of coffee that morning. To the father, that's nothing. To the child, it's everything. The father knows, son, I have resources that you know nothing of. You think you're making a big request? It's not so big to me. But I am delighted by your boldness. I'm delighted that you love me, that you think I'm a big enough father to provide something like that for you. And so Ezekiel was commanded. But the other aspect of it that just sort of floors me about this Man, this happened after he had already preached the word to them. 
I mean, wasn't it enough? I preached the word. Done, right? Not in Ezekiel's case. And men, please, as I said before, I'll repeat it again. I'm not trying to establish some kind of formula. But I'm just saying, in Ezekiel's case, it wasn't enough for him to only preach the word. He had to preach the word, and that's what came first. But after he preached the word, he had to pray. And pray that the Holy Spirit would use the word in a powerful way. That the Holy Spirit would come upon those bones that he had just preached unto. Charles Spurgeon said this. First, the prophet preaches to the bones. Here is preaching. And next, he prophesies to the four winds. Here is praying. The preaching has its share in the work, but it is the praying which achieves the result. For after he had prophesied to the four winds, and not before, the bones began to live. I just note that Ezekiel prayed after he had proclaimed God's word. I'll speak to those of you now, because I know there's many of you here. You have some kind of ministry in preaching or teaching God's word. And I'll speak to myself as well. We often neglect this aspect of our work. In some church traditions, there's the custom of what they call the vestry prayer. In some classic traditional churches, think kind of Anglican kind of thing. The vestry is the room, in a more modern architecture, we call it the green room. It's, it's the room from which the pastor or the choir enter to the service. And the idea would be in these church traditions that there would be a vestry prayer. There would be a vestry prayer before the service, but there would also be a vestry prayer after the service. Where the pastor, after preaching the word, would go and he would pray. And I'm not trying to promote a tradition, but I'm saying that there's a principle behind that tradition that has merit. And I'll just speak to myself. I need to give more attention to prayer after the preaching. And pray boldly. I need to pray for a general blessing on those who hear God's word. Lord, these people came. I can't believe it, Lord. They, they could be doing a thousand other things. There's all these things tugging at them, pulling at them. You, you think about the people who aren't there. Why don't you start thinking about the people who came? They could be doing other things. They came. Bless them, Lord. Bless them for coming. And then I pray. I pray, God, bless the spiritual seed that was sown, water it, fertilize it, cultivate it, Lord. We can pray for a hindrance to anything or anyone that would see, steal the spiritual seed that was sown. Lord, keep away those birds, those emissaries of Satan. Keep away the choking weeds that would extinguish life. Protect those seeds that were sown. We can pray that our hearers would remember what they should remember from the sermon. You know how it works, guys. Fantastic message, pastor, and they forget it all by the time they reach their car in the parking lot. <laughs> Lord, help them to remember what they should remember. Or how about this one? You could pray that they should forget what they should forget from your sermon. <laughs> For some of us, that's a big prayer. <laughs> We pray, Lord God, Lord, make these people doers of your word and not merely hearers. Lord, don't let them be a congregation that heaps up condemnation to themselves by receiving the word but not doing anything about it. And then we pray for ourselves. Lord, would you forgive me in ways that that sermon fell short? This was such a glorious passage, Lord, and I, I just feel I didn't do it justice. Would you forgive me for that? We can pray for humility, for whatever way the sermon was used by God. Isn't that an important prayer to pray? And then we can always pray for the grace to preach better next time. 
Man, I just think we need to do more praying after the message. That's what Ezekiel did. So he did it. Verse 10, I prophesied as he commanded me. And maybe this was an easier message to preach. No longer was he preaching to dead bones scattered throughout. Now he was preaching to at least animated corpses. But he prayed and he prophesied in the power of faith. And verse 10 says that breath came in them. After his faithful proclamation of the word, after his prayer that the Holy Spirit would come upon them, the work was completed. And look what happened. Verse 8. This is what we all want, isn't it? Oh, Lord, send it. An exceedingly great army. Those bones were not revived to become a group of spectators. God was not trying to raise up a great crowd of couch potatoes. He didn't want expert video game warriors. No, what he wanted was a great army for his kingdom. They lived to act under the orders of the one who gave them light. He saw an army assembled for action. I'm, I'm going to say this. With all word and no spirit we may become an army of the dead. Assembled, solid, but without the true breath of life. We have to say that when we look at what God has done in our whole Calvary Chapel family over the last 50 years, it has been a profound work of the Word and the Spirit working together. And we're going to be bold enough to believe that we don't have to sacrifice one or the other. That God, we will remain faithful to proclaiming your Word just as Ezekiel did. And at the very same time, we will pray, we will boldly pray, we will implore you for a mighty outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Well, let me conclude just with these verses here, verse 11 through 14. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Using a slightly different metaphor, now the bones are buried, but it's the same idea, just a slightly different metaphor. O oh, my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and performed it, says the Lord. I kind of want to conclude with looking at what they said in verse 11. What did the people say? Our bones are dry. Our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Now, the house of Israel at that time had reason to say it. Those from the southern kingdom were exiled in Babylon. Those from the northern kingdom, 150 years before, had been scattered all around the Assyrian Empire and showed very little interest in coming back. Objectively speaking, there was a lot of truth in what they said. Our bones are dry. We ourselves are cut off. But let me tell you something. God wanted them to stop saying this. God wanted them to stop saying our hope is lost. They had hope in the Lord. Now, I suppose if somebody says, my hope is lost, at least we can compliment them for their honesty. It would be much worse to have that in your heart, but never express it. If it's in your heart, at least speak it, be honest about it. But it is nevertheless unbelief to be repented of. Your hope is never lost as long as your God is not lost. And God is not lost. He knows exactly where he is and where to find you. With God's working through the word of God and through the spirit of God, there is always hope. Always. 
But let me clarify this. Some of you, you need to lose your hope. Because your hope is your own personal success. Your hope is your own personal fame. Your hope is your own personal recognition or comfort. It would be better to lose that hope. But brothers, the hope we cling to is the hope that God's work will continue as he intends it, full of faithfulness, full of integrity, accomplishing what he has purposed. Every one of us can hold on to that hope. Oh, but David, I pastor a little church in a very difficult community. You can have that hope. Of course you can. You can minister with faithfulness and integrity. You can preach to whatever dry bones there are or Mr. Ligaments next to you. You can do it. <laughs> you can pray boldly for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You can do that. And as long as you can, you are full of hope. But hopes that center on our own personal glorification or exaltation, let those hopes die. Who cares? So God never wants any of us to say, in the truest sense, our hope is dead. Through it all, he wants to reveal, then you shall know that I am the Lord. He said, verse 14, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. Do you believe it? I believe it. I believe that this is God's promise of restoration for Israel. And isn't it remarkable to see that has, how, that, how that has happened? Because right now we see Israel gathered, and you can make the case that right now Israel is gathered, assembled as skeletons, covered with sinews, covered with muscles, there's skin upon them, but what they lack, still being a secular state in many ways, they lack the breath of God upon them, but they're waiting for it. And at the right time, it will come. But to the surprises, God said it would happen in this kind of process. God gave it to us in stages. Why should we doubt that it would happen this way? So we believe that this is part of God's new covenant promise for Israel. But as God, in a beautiful and unexpected way, as he opened up the new covenant for us, for everybody who would put their trust in Jesus Messiah, we share in it also. And we can say with confidence, yes, Lord, I know you mean this primarily for Israel, but we say it among ourselves. Let these dry bones live. Let them be raised up as a spirit-filled great army for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, Lord, do it. Father, Father, I, I look out upon these men. <laughs> and Lord, it sure looks like a great army to me. They're, they're even assembled as if in ranks, Lord. They're just there in the rows. They're there. It's like they're, they're here for drill. They're here for training. We believe it, Lord. But Father, it can never happen until you you truly continue to give us faithful messengers to speak forth your word to us, and we continue to be those faithful messengers of your word. But Father, with boldness, we say, send forth your spirit. Do it, Lord. We do not ask for an outpouring of your spirit because we deserve it, because in any way we've earned it, but because, Lord, we know that we can never, never assemble and function as a great army unto you without that. So do it, Lord. Pour out your grace, your spirit upon us in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.